And good evening. This is the Eye of the Storm podcast for the Treasury markets, the SPX, the NDX, gold and silver, and the dollar index. And today's date is Sunday, January the 15th, 2023. And first, I hope you're all enjoying the uh, podcast that I did post earlier uh, with my friend Richard Friesen. Uh, it's a great podcast. If you've not had a chance to check it out, I really recommend it. The discussion today that I had with Richard really revolves around mindset, traders' mindsets, which is a very, very important topic for those of us that are trading, and particularly day trading or even swing trading or any type of trading. You have to have a particular mindset. And how do we keep that mindset? And how do we keep it protected? And what happens when it, we delineate from it? So there's a lot of information. And then plus, I think that uh, uh, Richard has a lot of products that are courses that teach. And so there's a lot of information there and a lot of help available to develop these very, very necessary tools. Now, <clears throat> where do I want to begin today? I'm going to begin again, as I did uh, last week. And I'm starting at the top of what I call my pecking order. So I'm going to start with interest rates. And basically, I want to continue the conversation on inflation. And again, how we can start to look at what the big rumor this week is how inflation and the Powell Fed has killed it. And what does that necessarily mean for investors? So it's a kind of a strange little bit of a title because I actually don't believe that Powell and the Fed have killed inflation. I think they just continue to roll it on. But we continue to get signs from them that, yes, we're we're still going to fight strong. We're still going to go for our goal. Our goal is to have inflation back down at 2%, uh, but they've got a lot of factors that are working against that. Uh, we just got figures that we saw, yes, the CPI showed improvement. But again, I think I've had this discussion. If not, I will bring it back in because it's an important discussion about because they go on the year over year figures and reminds yourselves that each month that year over year, it's not the whole year of 2022 or 2021 over 2022. It's the month of December 2021 over the month of December 2022, year over year, month over month. Again, a lot of stuff gets smoke and mirrored when they do that. And it's not showing exactly what truly is happening with the economy when it comes to inflation or what the Fed is doing when it comes to inflation. Also, what that came out last week dealing with inflation were the latest jobless claims data. And it showed that, indeed, less people are filing for jobless claims, more people are getting back to work. That in and of itself, as we know and have discussed, is inflationary. So are they? You got a dichotomy going. The CPI number just showed that we had an improvement in inflation, but the jobless claims show that there should be maybe a little bit more inflation, and so onward and upward we go. Now, just kind of beginning with this thing, I want to start by talking about modern monetary theory. That is how our country operates. That's how the Fed operates. And what it basically, if we look up on Investopedia as to what the definition of modern monetary theory is, and what it is, it's a macroeconomic theory that says countries that control their own currencies, like the U.S., are not constrained by revenues when it comes to government spending. And I'm going to do one last thing. I wanted to do one thing here. And I wanted to put me there. Hey, everybody, I've decided I'm going to show myself today. So because I'm going to make a lot of kind of like teaching and, and, and discussing and better than just looking at a chart, you get to look at my face. 
So modern monetary theory, a macroeconomic theory that says countries that control their own currencies, like the United States, are not constrained by revenues when it comes to government spending. So if we take a look a little bit deeper, then we can see that modern monetary theory is a heterodox, right? Now, I went and I looked up that word. We're all wondering, what is that word? Heterodox. It just suggests that it's not in accordance with established or accepted doctrines or opinions, especially in theology or uh, that are unorthodox, or holding unorthodox doctrines or uh, opinions. Interesting concept, you say? I think so. So here we have that modern monetary theory is a heterodox macroeconomic supposition that asserts that monetarily sovereign countries, that would be like the United States, United Kingdom, Japan, Canada, which spend, tax, and borrow fiat currency that they fully control. So each of us controls. The United States, we control taxing, borrowing, and our fiat, and we borrow off our currency. So we control the spending, the tax, the borrowing of the fiat currency, and that we are fully under control of that. And we are not operationally constrained by revenues when it comes to the federal government spending. So again, we are not constrained by revenues. How much does the country earn? How much does the country take in? We're not constrained by that when it comes to what the government can spend. Now, that sounds a little bit weird. And in fact, it kind of is. But it's been modern monetary theory. And this modern monetary theory has been in force for quite some time. And a lot of things have happened to build up to the point that we've gotten to. Now, one thing that I want to add is that as we're walking this down is it's 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 a game it's a game and the federal reserve and the treasury and the government i'm going to say that a the government our house of representatives and the senate get us in a lot of trouble because here we are sitting at a point where we've now, if you read anything last week, we heard that Janet Yellen, Secretary of the Treasury, has sent a letter off to Paul Ryan. Excuse me, not Paul Ryan, Kevin McCarthy. Sorry, you can tell how old I am. Those two came into the House of Representatives together. Paul Ryan's long gone. It's now Kevin McCarthy's turn. And in that letter, she stated that we are, she's hoping that there's not going to be a lot of disturbance or delay in discussing and eventually raising the debt ceiling for the United States. Now, we already heard from some of these new Congress people that were been sworn in, and also from McCarthy himself, that that fight will go on. We're not going to raise the debt ceiling. Okay. Because if they don't, the United States will reach the debt ceiling next Thursday, January the 19th, the government will reach the debt ceiling. They'll reach, you can't spend anymore. You've gotten to the height that you can get. You can't borrow anymore. You can't make anymore until we raise that debt ceiling. Now, granted, in all administrations prior, it's just automatically just raise the debt ceiling, raise the debt ceiling. But it's now getting to be scary. And rightfully so, I think that we do have some senators and some congresspeople who actually do have a voice to say, hey, like, come on, can we can we talk about this? Can we can pause this? Can we see what's really going on? But the problem has become, in my view, or what I see, is that when we politicize the economy and depend on their opinions, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. Because we can go back to Ronald Reagan, who was voted into office in 1980, and he began Reaganomics, or trickle-down economies, 
Where did it trickle from? You can go to my pecking order and you can just watch. Who sat at the bottom of that list? Ha ha, retail. Joe Average. Who got all that money? Trickle it down. It went to the government. They got it. Went to the senators and to the congresspeople. They got it. It went to the uber rich. They got it. What was left? Crumbs. Here, small people, here's your crumbs. That went, but how did we do it? Because they shrank government. They shrank budgets for departments that actually needed the money, i.e., to do repairs in our bridges and our roads to improve our infrastructure. So when you consider that the government ignored and said no to repairing the infrastructure in favor of not raising taxes, of giving more money to the larger, richer people in our country. So, you know, they got to pay less taxes. We get to, you know, whatever we got. And we then decided we're going to give them a voice. And that came later, uh, about, I think, about another 10 so years later. When we got the Supreme Court ruling, the corporations are people too. I might have been in the 2000s. Corporations are people too. Hence, we got Citizens United, where corporations can put money into politics. They could support their local candidate. Bull. We know that that money went in. We're suddenly running for president or Congress or the Senate even on a local level, or even on a state level, suddenly turned into multi-million dollar operations to get somebody elected. Well, if you're going to get elected because you're being backed by that kind of money, you're going to become holden to somebody or something, right? Now, politicize all of this procedure. And are they representing their constituents that are running over potholes, that have a bridge that's going to fall down? Or, i.e., like in Minnesota several years back, where the bridge did fall down, people died, just collapsed in the middle of traffic. Boom. That's the type of stuff that's happening in our country because we have spent year after year after year, decade after decade, of ignoring putting any money into infrastructure and getting the work done. Finally, we got, so, but mind you, Democrats, when they come into office, they would try to push some sting through, get this going. And they were fought tooth and nail all the way down the line and never really could get it done. Now we finally come up and we're going to get another Republican there, cut, 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 not going to even consider it, et cetera, et cetera. The rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and the cars got ruined because we drove them into holes. Now, we're sitting in, in current where the current administration did get passed an infrastructure bill, a desperately, desperately needed infrastructure bill, because now we're confronting the 21st century. And if we don't, it's going to take us back to live in the 18th century instead of the 21st century. We needed to modernize our roads, our bridges, our infrastructure, our electric grid, the way that we deliver water to people, we have to rebuild. They ignored it, they ignored it, they ignored it. And then even to just include broadband so that we have an infrastructure to get electronic data all over where it needs to be. They passed the bill. So now we're going to add in the inflation, right? Remember, we spend more than we take in. Now, if that was me, and I was spending a whole lot more money, and my debt levels were too high, and I was not making that much money, boy, I'm in trouble. But thank God our Constitution allows us, individuals and corporations, actually, to declare bankruptcy when we run into insolvency. That is your constitutional right, by the way. Everybody shies away from it. Can the U.S. government declare bankruptcy? Yes, they can. It's not sovereign debt. 
it's backed by the good faith and credit of the United States. So our credit rating would drop through the floor, of course, but the country can default on its obligations. And this is what Janet Yellen is threatening. Now, I don't know if she's threatening. She's stating in a letter, could happen if the House of Representatives and the Senate drag their feet on raising the debt level so that the country can operate. And from what I understand from this letter that she wrote, this allows, we have a slush fund or you know whatever you want to call it. So we'll be able to pay our bills to maybe June. I'm like, June? So if we don't raise the debt level, we only got five months? Holy cow. That's pretty serious. If they start dragging their feet, could this be the surprise that no one's really looking for that could turn the market suddenly? Possibly. That could determine rates are not going to go down, Fed's not going to pivot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because you see the narrative, right? You see the narrative that's out there right now. The Fed's going to pivot. The Fed's going to do good. The Fed's going to do this. Mm -mm. And then we have the Fed governor saying, please don't get too excited about that rally. Please don't get too excited that we're going to back off of our posture, which is to fight inflation and to continue to raise rates. So as I've been talking all along, I'll give you the Elliot and I'll say, I don't know what's going to cause this to happen, but I'm going to tell you what the wave pattern is and what it could suggest. And then we start to put this together it makes sense. Now, remind me, I'm going to remind you all that I've also been talking about the moves themselves in the equity markets, 2008, 2009. 2008, 2009 was, was a, a, a economic collapse. It was deflationary. This, the country went into recession and it was deflationary. And the only way that, they, that the Fed and the Treasury and the government could deal with this Without more banks failing, without corporations going down, without people being out on the street, et cetera, et cetera, was to reinflate. Okay, so thus the Fed came up with quantitative easing. So in essence, what happens during that period, when we think about it, is that quantitative easing brought about modern monetary theory and it put it on steroids now we all know what happens when an athlete is like trying to pump up their body on steroids they get roid rage or you know we've heard all kinds of things where they just get nuts that's kind of our economy at the moment it is nuts right so who's going to reel this in who's going to not inject the steroid into that. Well, right now, our government can't because we ignored the infrastructure for so long. We did, folks, that it has to be replaced. Otherwise, we drop in stature as a, as a first-rate country, right? We have some of the biggest money in our country. But our roads are falling apart. The bridges are dropping down. We don't have a rail system with tracks that can take us quickly across the country. The rail system needs to be fixed. The FAA needs to have better towers. The FAA needs to have better communications. All, all the infrastructure that keeps us all going needs to be replaced and fixed. Okay? So years ago... The United States and other countries decided to do exactly that. They put quantitative easing on steroids. And that exasperated, it was exasperated by that deflationary collapse of 2008, 2009. The governments and the central banks of the Western economies threw caution to whatever. And they put all of their modern monetary theory all these aspirations to the test by printing money, by creating money in order to get the economy out of its death spiral. 
So, but what happens in all of that, in this exercise to do this, it foots and kicks the can down the road as we've heard and we've heard and we've heard in the government and how each one who wants to be in power, I'll stop kicking the can down the road. Really? I'm not sure how you plan to do that. So we're talking about that money that got put into the economy back then. I thought originally it was like $8 trillion, but I'm hearing now it's more like $5 trillion. But we know that we've got this gigantic debt right now, sitting at $31.5 trillion is the U.S. national debt. So what we're looking at is that we had that big problem. They floated us out of it. Corporate America didn't die. We did see a lot of bank failures, but we saw a lot of them taken over. We saw some of the too big to fail get bigger, get more on tune that they, if they fail, the whole world goes down with them. That situation is yet to come, folks. So it was, an, it was a methodology that they used and continued quantitative easing. 2009, 2010, 2011, all the way up, which produced this rally. They're like, yo, this is working. Let's keep this going because we're getting a tax revenue. We're getting great stock market. People are making money. Everything's kind of coming in. And wow, this, this is all working. Then we got COVID. When COVID hit, it shut down the country quicker than anybody would have thought. We were all stunned. We were all in a state of shock. We were all disbelieving. But yet, we stayed home because we saw what was happening. And it was nasty. It was terrible. So what did we do? Or what did the government do and the Fed do? We redeployed. We redeployed that market, modern monetary theory, injected it with a fresh round of steroids, and put it back out there. And this time we pumped even more trillions of dollars into the economy. So, but we had to do that because they manually shut down the economy for COVID, during COVID. So again, are we going to blame one party? Are we going to blame the other? Are we going to blame the politicians? No. That was an unforeseen circumstance that happened. But the point is, it did happen. And a ton of money, trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars, was injected into the capital system. And we saw this. We saw it in our markets. We saw it in stocks like, I'm going to go over to the SPX. We, whoops, first I got to put it on the right, right right chart we saw it we saw it here i'm gonna let me bring this down this is like the maximum right here's the here's the 2008 2009 debacle and then boom 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 boom, boom. so even if i go like this right there's the bottom whole world's falling apart and trust me i was there and i was trading and it did feel like it right goes down now we're in this rage of a market oh this, folks, was two months. And basically, the bulk of it happened in three weeks. In March of 2020. February, actually. Where the NASDAQ lost, I think, 87% of its value. Again, not maybe not that high. I think it was, sorry, that that's the previous one. The NASDAQ lost, I think, like 38 or 37% of its value. In three weeks. In three weeks. Okay, so here we are. Nobody can go to work. How am I going to buy my groceries? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to pay the electricity bill? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it hurt a lot of people. It hurt a tremendous amount of people. And it hurt the lower rungs on our, on our stuff. People that were dependent on jobs that were outside in the service industry. They were decimated. And so the government handed out stimulus. And we didn't have to pay it back. God bless them. Because we wouldn't have been able to. Now, corporations, supposedly under TARP, 
back in 2008, 2009. And the government did toot their horn and said tarps have been all repaid. God bless them. Now, here we are. So now we stick trillions more into it. This is all inflationary, period, end of story. It's inflationary. Yeah, we all got lots of money. So I was like, well, I got the money. I can go buy it. But it made the rich richer and the on the marginalized, barely making it. Still barely making it. There was insurance. There was people getting sick. There was all kinds of things going on. So modern monetary theory, printing more than you take in. Hmm. How long could that go on? So now let's just try to understand. You're going to hear that, and even I use the word, it's like, the government prints money. Send, at the time, I would joke and say they're sending Janet Yellen out to the printing press, print out some more, Janet. You know, Or there was the big joke, and it even had these comic on Ben Bernanke in a helicopter, just throwing money out of the helicopter to all the people, right? So it's good to understand that the government actually does not print money. The government does not print money at all. It's the Federal Reserve. They buy bonds from a seller. Hmm. Who could that seller be? Let's say hmm, maybe the big industrialized families from the late 1800s into the 20th century, the 19th century to 20th century. All those people that were at that ground level floor, the industrialists that just took over the world. Case in point, J.P. Morgan. That was a real person. Read about his life. J.P. Morgan created the Federal Reserve, got his big old rich buddies, who just got richer and richer and richer. So we're talking about the, 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 the Morgans, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Mellons, the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The lines go on. The Vanderbilts. I mean, there's a big, long line of very, very rich family money that still exists. The Federal Reserve Bank is... A privately owned. Now, so the Res Federal Reserve buys the bonds from a seller who delivers the bonds to the Fed, and then the Fed deposits the money into the seller's account. Deposits our dollars and the dollars into the seller's account. So money's been created right out of thin air. So if the Fed's quantitative easing policy was totally exasperated by all of this. And it was accompanied by all the moral hazards of manipulating the markets. And it all happened right in plain view. We all saw it. We all understood it. Then came inflation. So it's almost as if the Fed, which I don't know, but I, 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 I want to give them the credit that they understood that it was going to be inflationary, but there was nothing they could do. We either let the economy go, we let corporate America go, or we let the U.S. population go. We just let them die. We just let them sink into oblivion, right? So, But, it, but some people are going to say that they just forgot Economics 101. So, But if you pump enough money into an economy, you will get inflation. It's just fact. That's just fact. And so as I keep telling you, the government has pumped in trillions, trillions of dollars starting in 2009 and kept that quantitative easing going so that everybody like Apple and Amazon and Google and, and all these companies could borrow money at almost no interest. And what did they do? They bought back their shares which made the company money. Hmm. Interesting stuff. So the rich continue to get richer. Corporates continue to get richer. Then we get up to pandemic. Well, we got to keep that quantitative easing going now. And sure as hell, didn't we? Right? Right at that maximum pain for the pandemic shutting down the country. Interest rates in the 30-year bond got to their lowest level ever, 1.17, 1%. 1 
10-year note was under 1% and so on down the line. Where if you had a savings account at your bank, maybe, maybe you got 0.15% or 0.25%, you know, a quarter percent of your money. And it stayed that way. But your credit card mm, went from 9 to 15 to 20 to 29 to 30. Mm. Do you see the roll off here? So you pump enough money into the economy and you get inflation. So I, I don't see how people really can think any differently than that, but they do. So if we try to think, is that, is that a lesson well learned? Has the government really got this all down? No, no. So if we think about it, it's like we look at the balance sheet. So what does the Fed really got to do? They want to control inflation. They want to bring interest rates back down. What and, and then start giving away the money at a much cheaper rate. How is that going to be done? Well, they're going to have to get all this excess off the balance sheets because you owe it. You owe it, Fed. We owe it as a country. And we're not taking in enough money to pay our bills. So you have to keep raising the debt ceiling so that we can continue to operate as a country, so that we can continue to pay our, pay our obligations, our obligations to our senior citizens. Let me raise my hand. Hello, my name is Michael. I am retired. But there are many, many people that are retired that they are dependent on their Social Security. And then we get Medicare. Folks, the, and, and then you've got people in the government and in, in, in the House of Representatives and the Senate saying, we'll just cut Medicare. We'll just cut Social Security. Really? Really? I don't know about you guys, but go talk to your, if your father and your mother are still alive, go talk to them and tell them how long they worked. How long they worked to get their Social Security. How hard they worked to get medical insurance so that they could retire because that was the gift that was going to be given to us. You do your duty to God and country, and the country will take care of you in your golden years. We have people in the House of Representatives and in the Senate that just don't want to seem to believe that. That's a threat, and it's a threat to a very growing large population within this country. It will fly. It will fly. So if we think about that, the Fed's balance sheet post the 2008 crash and quantitative easing, the Fed's balance sheet skyrocketed to about $9 trillion. The $5 trillion that I think is higher from the pandemic, and this is all via the, the New York Times. The New York Times figures that it was $5 trillion. That's what we uh, stimulus. And that spending alone, we had $1.8 trillion to individual families, blah, blah, blah. $1.7 trillion to the businesses. How they worked that out, I'll never know. We had state and local. They needed money. We had what we had to go start paying hospitals because they were just so understaffed and overworked, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a lot of money and inflation is real. And now they've got to start to reel in that excess. So you've heard me talk about what are they going to do? There's 6.1 trillion, 6.1 trillion dollars being thrown and run around at the end of the year looking for alpha. We all know what alpha is, right? Looking for money, looking for capital gains. That's what alpha is. And they're desperate to find it because that's their job. It's going to become more difficult. People are going to need that money. People are going to want that money. And what are the governments going to do? Debase it. How's that going to happen? Through inflation and then deflation and then recession, and all these things that we're being warned that we're going to go into. This is not something that is happening overnight. This is happening decades, decades upon decades in the works. And fiat currency is the one reason that suddenly things really turned what I believe sour. And you have to understand that in 1971, under the Nixon administration, 
they decided to get rid of the gold standard. And under the Brenton Woods Agreement, where currencies would be backed by the good faith and credit of the government or the country in which it was issued. Prior to that, my dollar was guaranteed by a dollar's worth of gold. So if you had money, it was guaranteed by gold. I will trade with you. Hence, gold is always going to be a storehouse of value. Well, so we've experienced since that time more panics, more crashes, more manias than we've ever seen before. So when we're talking about these people that are coming up with this great modern monetary theory, they don't have control over anything, really. So how am I going to think that they got the control over inflation? They run it through their models, and I think they got a hold of it, but it never seems to work. Because we continue to have these crashes and these manias and these problems and all these things continue to happen in our markets. We've had more. Well, we got this. We had the one in 2008, 2009. We had this one. We have this one. China war. Trade war. And now we're correcting all of it. So that was my introduction. I... I wanted to add that because I think it's real important to understand when I'm being told, well, you know, the 70s is very different than now. Now is very different than the 70s. So a 50% interest rate in the 70s would be equal to a 5% here. I was like, well, the difference is, is that the debt is 45% greater than it was in the 70s, which got it 30%. Now we've added 45% in two years. Two years, 2020 to 2022, 45% increase. It becomes problematic. They're continuing to kick the can down the road. All of that is true, but we're now painted into such a deep corner. If you talk about, right, paint yourself in a corner and you move back, you paint yourself in the corner and suddenly your back's against the wall and you can't get out. But you didn't just paint it because you can step over paint and get your shoes dirty. It's glue. It's gorilla glue or whatever you want to call it, super glue. You step and uh, you, uh, you can't move. That's what I think the Fed is basically backing themselves in. The only way out is to create more and then try to get your balance sheet back in process without another pandemic, without a crash, like we saw in 2008, 2009. But that's going to count on all the government agencies that are supposed to be watching the crap that took place in 2008, 2009 from happening. All right? That then puts too much weight on, oh, gee, we better go in and start taking a look at our bigger two failed, too big to fail banks, which the government promises that they were going to do. Did they? No. No. Did anybody really go in? Yeah, they slapped J.P. Morgan's hand. Because guess, by the way, folks, in case you didn't know, go check out. If you get Netflix, there's this thing on Bertie Madoff. It's a four-part four, four series. Check it out. Find out who was and who held Bernie Madoff's checking account for his Ponzi scheme. I'll give you a hint. Jamie Dimon. J.P. Morgan. And they got dinged a, a large number. I want to say $30 billion or something like that, which are like, eh, no problem. Ah, cut the check, hon. Here. That's good, though. You can you can deposit. And kept going. Did I tell you how much money they make? And they're too big to fail. Derivatives. That was all supposed to be a, a problem. Mortgages, that was the biggest problem. Selling crap paper. And then piling it and scooping it together and putting it in tranches and selling it to the public and selling it to institutions as AAA paper. Really? Mm -hmm. Has that changed? I don't know. So again, learning from our mistakes, implementing the change, I don't know. Here we are, off, off, up. We've gone straight up 
from the low in 2009. We've gone even straighter up from the low in March of 2020. It's time to reconfigure and clean up our mess or we're all going to go down. And they're not able to do it because they're so backed up into that corner that to stop the stimulus, the country comes to a standstill because we need to get that infrastructure fixed. Now, we've got politicians spouting off because they want to be reelected because of course, they have the golden goose. They get paid no matter what. Oh, we're going to stop Social Security checks. Are you stopping your own? What about your donors? Check out in the government how many go in as average Joes and come out millionaires. How is that possible? I didn't think senators got paid all that much. Right? So here we are. What's our way out? They got to get inflation under control. What's one way of doing it? Making the interest rates higher than the rate of inflation. Well, let's just kind of jack around and dolly the, the numbers up a little bit. And we'll call it month over month or year over year. And look, we're showing you year over year inflation's coming back down. Woohoo! Bull. Bull. You can jerry rig anything. Yes, energy prices have come down, but we'll get that a higher weighting. Food prices have not. Many different things that are still out there are not making any adjustments to the downside. Buying a tractor, buying equipment, buying a house, buying what takes to build that house, paying the con contractors to build it for you. Farmers, everybody, inflation, wage inflation, got to have it. We created it by injecting bazillions of dollars into the economy after the pandemic because we got to have all these people working, right? And then you get the tech industry, which, by the way, is just down the peninsula from me, where the average salary that Facebook, a.k.a. Metaverse, was paying people, paying their coders, their engineers, $241,000 a year. Oh, well, they're worth it. Really? What are you doing now, Mark? Laying them off. Sorry. Can't, I got to. Stock prices go through the roof. Now your CEO is going to be worth $9 billion or $90 billion or $451 billion, a.k.a. Elon Musk. Is that healthy? Is that distribution? No. We are in an inflationary period, and it's now time to pay the piper. And that is going to happen. Whether they're going to stand there and tell you we're going to do all these things to prevent it from happening, it's going to just cave in on its own weight. Starting now with the bond market, let's take a look at the 30-year bond. And thank you, by the way, for listening. I'll step down off that soapbox. Let's go take a look at the 30-year bond. Very, very interesting in the bond markets because as I've been describing, off, and this is the monthly chart. So as of the 13th, which was Friday, the 30-year bond yield was 3.61, down nicely from the end of the year, which was at 3.97. So again, I'm beginning to think, well, gee, what do we got going on here? Do we have, well, again, long-term, long-term, I'm going to bring this down right away so I can just really show you what all this is looking like. On our long-term chart, this is the weekly, we've got three years, long-term interest rates are on a down cycle. Interest rates should continue to move lower. But right now, we're in because we have five waves down. So my longer-term view is that interest rates will again go down, but in between the two legs down, right, bond prices go down and the yield goes up. So what I'm thinking is that interest rates, the yields will go down again, which suggests 
bond markets will rally again. We're in a correction. So yields have done five waves up. Bond market has done five waves down. The price, the bond price. We're doing a three-wave rally up, and then we have another five down. So right now, we're in a bind where the yields are going to correct a little bit and then drop to finish the down cycle for the bond price. Not for interest rates, for the bond price. So right now, we're in that in-between counter trend rally phase for the bond prices. And <clears throat> what it looks like is that we're going to do an ABC, five down, three waves up. And right now, I think I can get, <clears throat> excuse me, an ABC up in here in the 30-year bond for wave A of that ABC. And then I got this down, which is beautiful. And is that the entire B wave? Or is it A of B? Because don't forget, this A wave was five. One, two, three, four, five. B wave should be also three. A, B, we get a C wave down, I think. I originally thought, okay, this could possibly be the whole ABC. And we're just going to head out of here. And it was very strong. Last week and the week before were very strong in, in the 30-year bond. But now I'm beginning to look at this and go like, hmm, A, B, C. So what do we do first? Well, we come back down and give another test of 4%. Maybe drop a even a little bit further than 4%. Maybe we do get back up to maybe 4, 4 4.10 or 4 and a quarter percent. I'm not sure. We can track it as it happens. But if we should, and then once that is done, so we get ABC A, ABC B, then we get five wave C, and that's when I'm looking for it to go from wherever it is, say if it's four or four and a quarter, up to about three, two and a half, three. And let me show you the converse to that. And all we need to do is go to the 30 year market yield. And I just need to change my style over here and go back to the candle. It should go back to the line chart, maybe. I was showing that to me before. There we go. <clears throat> so here in the yield, we have five waves up. One, two, three, four, go to five. So we're doing an ABC down. Hmm. So bond yield goes up, prices, bond prices go down, and the yield goes up. Bond prices go up, the yield goes down. Okay, so here, five up should be followed by three down. So is this the A and this the B? And now I'm looking for the C? Or... Is it the A, A, B, C, B, then the C wave? That's kind of what I'm thinking. Because this, I bet you if I open it up and go down, I'd probably be able to count as either a three wave A, B, C. And then this should be three waves back up again to 4%. Maybe four and a quarter. It should not go above because that makes it just an ABC flat. And then we come back down in yield, maybe to three and a half, maybe down to three and a quarter before we do the next big leg. Okay? The next big leg where the bond prices drop and the yields go up. Now, how do I figure that all in when I'm looking at, remember, in, in our equity markets, I'm saying that I'm still looking for a primary C wave down to complete. Well, if we kind of start to drop, if there's a threat that the government will be shut down, if the Republicans in the House of Representatives decide they're going to play hardball to kick off their new season, whatever's going to happen, right, it's going to be a jolt to the system. Now, I've been continuing to talk 
that in these markets, it's going to be a jolt to the system, a jolt to the market to get it to move in the direction that I'm looking for. Why? Because I'm expecting a third wave, an intermediate third wave to continue in the equity markets. That's going to be quick. That's going to be fast. That's going to drive it lower. But when it's all done, I get a three and a four and a five done. I've got cycle wave A done. Cycle wave B is going to scream for these rates to come down. Then it will fit. Because if you remember, as I was talking last week, I was wondering how in God's name is this rates going to get lower while the market intends to go itself lower? Right? Instead of up, I'm still looking for the market to go down. Well, now we've got a lot of talk where it's like the world's convinced the market's going to go up. Well, what could take it? What could do it? I don't know. Maybe it will be. Kevin McCarthy and the new Republican majority in the House. Sorry, we're not even going to discuss it. There would be no, we're not raising the credit limit of the United States. We're not raising the debt limit. That's what we promised our people, the citizens of the United States. Bahui. Whatever their play is. Okay, so that leaves open this possibility here. We got the A wave down. We do an A, B, C. And we go back towards four, four and a quarter. Four and a quarter. And then make this a nice flat and bring it all the way back down to three and a half, maybe down to three and three quarters, three and, and, and a quarter. Then we get, then we get that next whoosh, big move. So, and that would be that B wave, right? The B wave. So if I can get back up to here, finish this in, in uh, cycle wave A, and then I get a cycle B wave here as well. Nice. Oh, fit. We see that the we get a little QE going. Oh, they're going to back off. Oh, they're going to pivot. It's like, well, then then I would probably agree with you. All right, so that's that. Now. If I'm looking at, and I got to do this a little quicker because I'm doing a whole lot of talking here. Ten-year note, same deal, right? We've kind of coming up. We're starting to roll over a little bit. It's like if this is like one, two, three, four, five, A, B, and that's the A of the B and the B of the B, and we do a C of a B and bring it back down to here to four, or even a little bit lower, and then rally. In the bond rally in the bond so maybe we i don't think we rally first i think we drop and we head back down to 111 even a little lower and that's just the internal b wave of an abc up these all stay in place along with all of that but i think we need to come down first finish this b wave and then put in that c wave and look at the five they're all doing the same thing they really are so five years, same deal. A little bit clearer. One, two, three, four, five. Beautiful A wave. A, B, got to do the C wave first. Then it can rally. So I'm seeing it over and over again. And lastly, I see it in the two year as well. So again, and we're seeing it starting to kind of come in action here. If I go out here on the 13th, so Friday, the uh, two year note finished the week at 4.22%. 4 down almost a quarter percent from the end of last year. So I'm like, mm, okay, ABC, A, ABC, B, and then we put in a C wave, make it look real nice. So that's kind of what I'm thinking there in the interest rate market. Now I want to go over to the SPX. Let's see if I can get through this in pretty good timing here. Uh, I'm going to go down to the daily chart. <clears throat> Again, what we got going on, I'm still in that B wave. Excuse me, I'm still in the primary C wave down. And we've done intermediate wave one and two. And I'm going to put back my other. I don't need that one. I may use it later. Uh, wait a minute. That's over here. I'm going to put my mic. Oh. Make sure I'm doing it. That's not a bar chart. I want to handle and so we have intermediate wave one, intermediate wave two, and then actually I needed to move over, I believe. 
Um, no, one, two, three, four, five. Minor wave one, this whole kit and caboodle. I still think that we are really pushing against um, finishing up this minor wave two. And this was Friday. Here we are now into Globex on a Sunday. Tomorrow's a holiday. I'm not counting on too much here. Just this play back and forth now that the China's open or Asian markets are open. We'll see. But we do have continued upside potential. So, but I'm, I am expecting an end to this minor wave two. We do have 4030 to 4038 still sitting up there as potential. Um, <clears throat> and we have made our, our new highs that we needed to see within this minor wave too. Next step, folks, falling down quickly and hard. That's what I would expect in the minor third of the intermediate third. So that fits with a threat of a government shutdown. That's all I think it could take is the threat and we start to roll over. Number-wise, in terms of what we got coming next week economically, let me just take a peek. Uh, we really don't have anything. We have PPI final demand on Wednesday before the market opens with retail sales. That'll give us something. Industrial production comes on Wednesday. Housing starts jobless claims. Philly Fed on Thursday. Existing homes on Friday. So we basically have nothing. Tomorrow's a holiday. Tuesday, slow as a pancake. Got nothing really coming out. So in terms of numbers, we go out until Wednesday. So I'm looking for this thing to turn. I am looking for it to start to come down. And we are sitting on the daily. We're sitting right at that 200. <clears throat> this is on the cash market. We're sitting at the daily 200 on the SPX. Cash market, I cover in this, not the future. Uh, that I'll be doing tomorrow on just a regular Elliott Wave update. So I'm looking for it to turn. I got a pretty much a flat 50. It's starting to turn. Even the 21 starting to turn, but you'd think it would go a little bit faster. So those two, the only one that are moving are the five and the eight, as they should. Okay, going over to the NDX. NASDAQ's going to tell us the exact same story. We've got intermediate wave one and two of the primary of the um primary C wave, which is going to consist of five waves of intermediate degree. Then I have Minor wave one coming up into minor wave two. And within that, I think we're finishing. Now, we've gotten up above. We got above. We got above. We got above. In fact, I think we got above 16,000. Did we not? No, we got close. I think we can make it. We might be able to make it up to 11,600 and start to, to just kind of die up there. And I can put that back in, actually. And let me just, I'm going to, I'm just going to use the straight retracements. And this again is the NDX. Okay. So the NDX, yep. We do have up here 11,725. And right there, I got 11,590. So 11,600 almost right in that area. But yeah, I can do it. So we might still have a little bit of rally and a, whew, we fall off the cliff. That's my take on those equity markets. Going over to gold, gold coming alive, folks coming alive very, very nicely, starting to pick up the rally again as we come in, as the Asian markets open and then Europe will be next. We have the dollar being hit again. Another thing that's kind of getting interesting, what's going to happen with interest rates and everything else is going to be being played out in the dollar. But right now the dollar is breaking below support, which is going to put it into a different type of a scenario. And I'll go over that in a second. So what we got going on here, we got the four, right? Gold, got the four, a minor four. We're in that minor fifth wave. It started out really slow, but now I'm going to count it for you to see if it makes sense to us. So we have wave one of minor five, wave two of minor five, and then we had a one, two, one, two, one, two. It's subdividing three times as it should. It's in a fifth wave and within it, the third of the fifth wave, which should be pretty powerful within that powerful fifth wave. So we've got three, right? So even here, I got one, two, one, two, one, two, th three, four, five of this three, and then a four, five of this three, and then a four, five of this three. So we got a ways to go. 
2000 almost seems like it is going to happen. And I do see it. I do see that we should be able to get up there without a problem. And this is going to be very interesting to me because uh, we haven't been there since uh, 2022, March, last March. Maybe we'll do it by this March. But I think in this case, we're going to keep going. I do believe we should keep going on this. Bringing it all the way out to my monthly, I would have to run my fibs here to here. Okay, so let me bring this down to my weekly. Let me get to the 20 year weekly. And I can from, uh, yes, three to, no, that was wrong. Sorry about that. I got to pay attention to what I'm doing. Remove it, move it to this. So there, there, to there. You can see we have plenty of numbers. If wave five is equal to wave three, which it can be, because wave five is usually the nicely extended wave, not the third, then we're looking at 2,500. They're pretty much factoring in 2,000 now. So silver, I mean gold, picking up the pace, which is good to see. That is picking up the pace to the upside. The daily and moving average wise, all looking very nice. The 50 is now above the 200. We've got an alignment on the daily or an alignment on gold to continue to rally. Even that 200 beginning to shift and move itself higher. It's the bigger boat, takes longer, needs more time and more space. But now we got the 55 going, we got the 21 going, we got the eight and the five all pointing very strongly higher. I expect this rally to continue. It will have corrections, but I expect that the, that the intent now will be to move to the upside. Taking a look at silver, last I spoke about silver last week, I thought it was the laggard. It is also starting to pick up, but it gets caught up in itself. So I think I'm not sure I'm going to like this pattern. And I'm not necessarily trading silver uh, because it's still kind of really choppy. And it kind of gets its own world. But silver can do this and this and this, where it'll just go. This is a daily. So you get three, four days of it just kind of goes. It'll catch up real quick, be at 2627. Remember, we got just a 382 is 2937. Pulling this little guy open to a weekly chart. And we're looking at some pretty high numbers. I do suspect that silver eventually will get itself back about that high. And that high is 4970. So I'd expect it to get above there and to keep on going. And then lastly, not least, our friend, the dollar index. Look what's happening to the dollar. It has come down to <clears throat> as low as it can get in terms of support. And <clears throat> it's it was actually resistance from the way up. Now it's, it's planning and support. I feel very bad because I was not expecting this. I actually was expecting the dollar to turn and to move up and put in another high. It still can, but it's not happening right now. By far, it's not happening right now. This pattern, if I just bring it down to the three week, you're going to see one, two, and then it just starts to get a little choppy. Even if I do one, two, three, and this is a four, and this is a five, it's done five down. It's going to be a longer longer period of time before we see the dollar really be in a position where it's going to start breaking higher and not stop like we did see here. Doesn't mean it won't happen again, but I don't, I don't think it's really in the cards for right now. In fact, we got the next stop now that we we broke and closed and are remaining below the weekly 50 EMA, mm, not a pretty picture. The 20 is turning negative. The five has already crossed the 50. The eight hasn't yet. So there's still things that could happen and produce a little rally, but I'm not looking at it. And <clears throat> it does spell trouble for the dollar, which spells trouble for a lot of other things. But um, I will do some deeper work on this and see if I can't come up with some of the internals and see what's going on with the dollar, since it's basically not doing what I 
was not expecting. But the dollar has not been a market that I've actually uh, cover and, and carry Elliott with. So I'm going to compare it against a couple of uh, friends of mine who actually do the dollar and do currencies and see what we can come up with. And that's all for today. I want to thank you all for listening. I want to thank you all for participating with me today as I was able to explain a little bit more about this inflation, about modern monetary uh, theory, monetary theory, and how that all is kind of fitting in and what's behind it and what's behind the Fed really going like, well, we're fighting inflation. It's like, really? But you just put through a $1.7 trillion stimulus, All right? Granted, it's putting a lot of people back to work because we're going to rebuild the infrastructure of our country, desperately needed, but it's deflation. It's inflationary nonetheless. So we'll have more on that. Now, tomorrow, markets are not open. It's a holiday where we are honoring the late Dr. Martin Luther King, but Globex will be opening at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. here on the Pacific Coast. It is still raining here, but thank God I live at the top of a hill. And you know what they say, well, everything rolls down the hill. But there's been some serious flooding here in San Francisco and in the area. And particularly in the hills, they're, they're drenched and the hills are sliding. And so there's a lot of road closures, a lot of damage being done by these storms and they're not over. I'm feeling that I'm being told, at least by the weather services, we should have some more heavy rain tonight into tomorrow and Tuesday, and then it stops. That might be the end of the atmospheric rivers for a little bit, and we get a chance to dry out and recover. Thank you again for listening. And the next update will be the Elliott Wave update, and those will just be on the S&P and the NASDAQ, and that will be tomorrow. Tomorrow.